So, hi everybody, we are here live today with ProCare Health as our sponsor, hi. and Brittany and I just want to say hello on this Tuesday. We are doing our live today this week on Tuesday instead of Wednesday because I'm going to be traveling. And so we're, we're glad you guys are here. We're going to be talking about getting your finances in order for bariatric surgery. And we're going to be talking about, you know, the pre-op, all the requirements um, as far as, you know, about having surgery. I'll kind of go into that all right here in just a moment. But we're also going to be, going to be talking about those people. So the people who are preparing for weight loss surgery for the first time and those who are interested in revisional surgery. Um, a little history on um, my background. A lot of you probably already know me and you know Brittany, but just in case, um, uh, I worked as a weight, uh, weight loss surgery coordinator, bariatric coordinator for a program um, for about seven and a half years. And uh, I basically, when we started the program, I was the only employee for that program besides our uh, director <laughs> and our physician or surgeon. And then our program grew um, to probably 10 people. I mean, it grew up pretty fast within that amount of time. But um, in the beginning, I was doing everything. So I was doing all the insurance calls, all the pre-op education, post-op. I was doing the clinic stuff. So in that came a lot of experience with dealing with insurance companies and dealing with the financial part of having weight loss surgery. For many people, that's a hurdle because some people can afford to have surgery if they don't have insurance, some can't. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's it's a big huge consideration going into weight loss surgery because it can be it can be expensive so we're going to be talking about that and how to get around some of those hurdles some um, easy ways to navigate the system and maybe some little cheaters too <laughs> so um welcome if you're on the call and if you're a patient or if you're a program um, coordinator a nurse a dietitian um whatever some of this may even be helpful and i'd love for your input as we go through this you might have some helpful tips too i know uh, Gwen is on our call and she is um she is with a, a bariatric surgery program yes so we're gonna say I something wanted... Brittany. yeah i just want to say hi to kathy she says hello from georgia on facebook we are on facebook brenda i just wanted to wonderful let you know. um Sometimes we have problems uh, showing up in both places at the same time, so I just wanted to make sure. Um, hi, GC. <laughs> it's UF Shan Health Shans. I knew that it was. Health I knew Shans. that it was with a program. So Florida. I'm just excited that you're here again with us, because um, because you might have some points with this too, and this is recorded. Yeah. Um, I went through my notes and under the ask a question feature, I kind of put a little bit of our outline, meaning like asking questions, what we're going to be answering. So we're going to go through those and those are all going to be time stamped. So if for some reason you miss a part or you want to come back and listen to a part, that will be available on the replay. It's all going to be time oh, Sorry about that. I had my volume okay. turned up. I thought I had it down. I'm kind of doing the same thing Brittany is. It's kind of getting on my phone and looking at our Facebook page too, so that I can kind of keep up too. She's, you're good at keeping up with all that, Brittany, but sometimes I like just kind of seeing it too. It's kind of like holding the GPS when you're driving, you know, you wanna, <laughs> instead of having somebody else navigate, but. <laughs> um, well, let's kind of get started. I think. Um, okay. I think that we, um, I think we can uh, just just get this party rolling. So one of the very first things that many people um, do when they're first getting ready is, is kind of trying to figure out, you know, what the qualifications are for weight loss surgery. And I will say from program to program, they vary just a tiny bit. You know, sometimes your physicians or your staff or maybe your equipment um, will have certain considerations of what what they want. But overall, like if you look at the ASMBS uh, website, which is stands for American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, they're the ones who collect a lot of data on surgical procedures and all of that. And they kind of have um, 
some information kind of with, with stipulations. Now, Medicare and Medicaid do have a big impact on regulations. A lot of times private insurances will kind of follow this, but let's kind of start there with qualifications. And I am going to pull up an extra screen so I can kind of watch. And while we're talking about this, this is going to be mainly things that are relevant in the United States, correct, Brenda? Yeah. So, so if you have any Canadian that. listeners, this is probably going to be uh, quite a bit different from that because I think that the, it's done differently there from my understanding, um, surgeries and how it's paid and everything. So um, this is going to be for just the United States, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not familiar. I'm glad you brought that up because I really am not familiar with um, Canada. So if we do have anybody, a lot of times we'll have people from Canada listening. Mm -hmm. I'd be really interested to know if, if there's what the differences are too. Yeah. Um, and we ship to Canada too. So um, it's possible we have some can Canadian listeners. Yeah. So we have GC from Florida, and where's everybody else joining us from? Let us know. Kathy was from Georgia. Oh, <laughs> I'm hoping all you guys are a lot warmer than where Brittany and I are. I think it's like oh, it's right freezing. Now. It's it's been kind of cold. Today's supposed to get a little warmer, but this it's starting I think Wednesday and Thursday we're supposed to be in the single digits again. So yes, I know. <sighs> If it's going to be this cold, it just it should snow. That's my opinion. <laughs> Build a snowman. Okay. Well, this first one is what qualifications are generally required to have a primary weight loss surgery? If you've Stand never down. had bariatric surgery before. So if you're primary, you're going in for the very first time. Um, so one of the things is a body mass index of 35. And if you're not sure what your body mass index is, it's a calculation. And I... I honestly, as a, even as a coordinator in my previous role, really never figured it myself. I always just got on line and did the calculators online. Mm -hmm. um, National Institutes of Health, NIH, has a calculator that I is, was my favorite go-to. And um, like you could put in your height, like five, seven, five, six, whatever it is, and your weight, and it will calculate your body mass index. Body mass index, at least 35 to 40, okay? Um, so depending on your insurance, depending on your program, um, if you have a body mass index of 35, sometimes there's additional comorbidities that's required. Um, and it looks like GC answered too. She said, body mass index is a person's weight in kilograms divided by the square of height in meters. So if that helps you with figuring it, if you just, you don't wanna to have to use a calculator, you, you know, online, you can <laughs> use GC's um, calculation there. The actual calculation use online. Um, yeah, so it, I mean, it is helpful to kind of know, especially as you're, you're right in there. So 35 body mass index, a lot of insurances require a comorbidity. If you have a body mass index of 35, some require at 40 as well, but it, some don't require if your body mass index is 40, some is just that you're okay to go. Um, so it re insurance requirements vary on what the BMI starting point is, but typically lowest is 35. There are some procedures outside of that, like um, a balloon, surgery, which is not really usually covered by insurance, um, but mm -hmm. sometimes people's BMI can get lower, 30. I know our physician, sometimes if people were paying out of pocket, he could be a little more flexible with that, um, but generally that's where we st where starting points are. Um, what typically counts as a comorbidity? So what is a comorbidity? Usually it's things, it's a medical condition um, that kind of goes alongside the obesity problem, and some of those are diabetes or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, certain cardiac and respiratory illnesses like sleep apnea. Um, previous di diet attempts must have been tried and the participant was unsuccessful. So it's not like weight loss surgery generally would be the very first thing you jump into. Obviously, a lot of these people who are who are preparing for weight loss surgery or who are doing weight loss surgery have tried numerous other things. and. As far as documentation, um, 
usually, I know the program I work for, we would require patients to just make a list of everything that they've tried before. Mm -hmm. You can't always remember everything. Like literally, most people have been on 20 fad diets, you know, but like making a semi list so that you can prove to the insurance. And she also says, what's important to know is it's a insurance industry standard. It does not account for anything other than height and weight, nothing about water, muscle or adipose. That's so true, you know. Um, it's too bad there's not, you know, better measurements with that because yeah. you can have um, somebody who's very strong, has a lot of mus- muscle content, and then um, their body BMI may be pretty high, but mm-hmm. it's not, so it's not taking into account those things. So that's a great thing. But BMI is what we have to use. And like, it's driven by the insurances, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, so the next thing is, is, um, typically, uh, and it doesn't have to be the first starting point, but usually a primary care doctor, um, must sign off or a doctor saying that you're okay, that the surgery is medically necessary. Okay. And that's typically an insurance requirement. Like your doctor has to, a, a doctor other than just the bariatric surgeon has to say that you're medically okay to proceed with surgery. Um, Most require a psychological exam. Usually the facility you're going to will give you resources or recommendations on who to see for that. Um, Not all doc, not all psychologists or social workers um, do those pre exams for Mm -hmm. preparing for weight loss surgery. So you kind of got to make sure I would talk to the program, um, talk to the program that you're interested in seeing because you want to make sure you have a qualified psychological provider that is able to say that you're safe to proceed with surgery. And the big things that you're usually, yeah, the big things they're usually looking for is, um, you know, it's not really that you, how can I say this? It's more like really big red flags. Like maybe you have active um, bulimia or anorexia. Well, it wouldn't be really usually anorexia, but some kind of really large eating disorder that would make it more difficult for you um, other than just, you know, over overeating that type of thing. Um, like su- like recent si- suicidal attempts or um, recent um, uncontrolled depression. I mean, depression and anxiety are pretty normal for people who have, and that wouldn't necessarily throw you out, but you have conditions that maybe need additional addressing. It doesn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't be able to have surgery. Maybe you just need additional treatment beforehand. Um, Brittany, I know there's a comment. You want to read that? A couple of them, maybe. For... I just wanted to say real quick on Facebook, Sandra um, says hello from Ohio. Hi, Sandra. (laughs) Uh, I will actually be in Ohio at the end of this month. Uh... I'm not sure if you're part of the Ohio Bariatric Meetup group on Facebook. If not, I would highly, highly recommend that you look them up on Facebook and join um, their group. They're, it's a group of wonderful, wonderful ladies, and that's what um, they're doing a an event at the end of this month. So um, that's why I'll be in Ohio. But I just wanted to say that. And then uh, you said we have some comments on Crowdcast. Uh, GC, I think we went over hers already. Winter... I don't really know what that comment means, Brenda. For that, we hold of this weather. I would like to talk to you. We'll get that covered. I have to do Do you know what? Let me read it again. Go ahead with GC's. Okay. Um, and GC said, and a good bariatric psyche eval should give coping skills and prepare the individual for what to expect. Correct. Um, and you know what? I'm so glad that Gwen brought, she, Winter said to disregard. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was wondering um, if it was like a, a Siri type thing. Yeah. She heard you talking and that's happened to me before. Oh, I just, I send a random person <laughs> nonsense and they're like, what is this? <laughs> but Siri knows. Um, yeah. So Gwen has a huge point there. Like, yes, definitely. I think I we figure like our program <laughs> Once we kind of got really established and we started really looking, because um, part of being, um, we were, our hospital is a center of excellence, which I think wins is too. And part of that is meeting certain quality standards. And one of those things is, is looking at your post-op visits, hospitalizations, procedures, extra uh, extra thing. Yes, she, they are too. So MBSA, QIP, 
accredited. Um, and one of the quality standards is is making sure that your people aren't coming back, you know, frequently for procedures. And we have this problem with a lot of our patients coming back post surgery with um, nausea, vomiting, and things like that. Insurance flakes to use COE, yes, Center of Excellence. Um, so we really took a hard look at our readmissions after surgery. And one of the big things was, is patients struggling with nausea and vomiting after surgery and overeating. And we really dove into that and we, we had them see our, um, social worker, um, or psych, psych, psychology expert, um, post-surgery. Um, at intervals as opposed to just before surgery because we were addressing some of the eating disorder, eating issues. So people were just not knowing how much to eat. They were overindulging and things like that. And we found that it was a behavioral thing rather than just a medical issue like strictures because we were doing a bunch of EGDs like scoping people right and left to make sure they didn't have a stricture. And it was a lot of it was psychological like they were it was behavioral. So I want to say that that component is so important before and after surgery. You're so right. Um, and you must be willing, and this sounds obvious, but you must be willing to make dietary changes pre and post-op mm -hmm. surgery. Otherwise the surgery is never going to work. It's not just the surgery, you know, that is a requirement. Like they have to have documentation showing that um, smoking sensation uh, may or may not be required by your insurance or your surgeon, but it is strongly recommended. Um, some doctors won't do surgery. I know our program, we, the doctors, if they were doing a bypass, they were a lot more strict with that because the risk is so much greater because of the um, issues with ulcers around the anastomosis, which is the area where um, the stomach is actually attached to the intestinal area and there's a lot more risk there. Um, with sleeve gastrectomies, they were a little bit more flexible. Now, I've known some programs that just definitely won't proceed. So, um, I um, dealt a lot with Missouri Medicaid as well. We had a lot of Medicaid patients and Missouri Medicaid would not cover surgeries if you smoked. So they had to have pre-screening. So mm -hmm. every insurance company, every state's a little different, especially with Medicaid, Medicare, a lot of them probably are generally fairly close to the same. Um, not sure with Medicare. I'm thinking that Medicare, it was uh, recommended as well. So um, any other comments before I go forward, Brittany, or do you have anything? Uh, no, we don't have any other comments. Um, uh, nope, nothing else. We're good to go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the next one, how about what qualifications are generally required to have a revisional weight loss surgery? <laughs> this can be a little bit more tricky. What a revision means is you've had a previous weight loss surgery, whether it be a lap band, a sleep gastrectomy, um, a VSG, which is a vertical sleep gastrectomy, a, um, there's a lot of other procedures that they used to do that, um, that maybe sometimes they can revise. And I'm just gonna say the big, th th there's a couple things that, that they take into consideration. First thing, um, as far as, and now we're talking about insurance coverage and revisional surgeries can get expensive. So if you're wanting your insurance to cover, usually generally it can be a couple different things. It could be maybe you're experiencing medical problems. So like, let's say it's reflux, pain, uh, maybe there's a stricture, meaning things aren't going down well. There, the arrow area down in the bottom of your esophagus is, is narrowed. Maybe if you had a lap band, there was a slip or um, an ulceration around the lap band, or maybe um, some issues with it not working properly. Um, and then, or an anatomical issue, maybe a... Um, it's slipping my mind here, but something that, that the food isn't going through correctly. Now we did actually even have a couple patients that, and this is rare, but they had like a gastric bypass and we had to reverse it because they just didn't tolerate it. They, they couldn't make the changes necessary, the eating changes. Mm -hmm. um, and so they wanted to go back. But most of the time, if it's a medical issue, it's some of those things. Um, 
And GC says revision is modifying the same primary surgery, conversion from initial pr primary to another type of surgery, like a lap band, a sleeve, or sleeve to a ruin Y bypass. Yes. So revision, she's right. So there's a difference between a revision and a conversion. A revision is doing something to the same procedure to make it more effective, I'm gonna say, um, and then this, or to help aid in a correction of some kind of problem that they're having. And then a conversion, you're, I mean, you're definitely right. Conversion is just to go to a different procedure. So an example of a conversion would be if somebody's had a, a sleeve gastrectomy and they're going to a duodenal switch. I hope I'm saying that right because I know some of the, um, I don't know if you do the abstracting, Gwen, from, uh, for, for your accreditation, but I know that the definitions can be a little different, but I'm thinking that would be an example. Or maybe you had um, she said yes a sleeve and you're going to a bypass. Um, so those are some just examples. Um, going from a lap band to a sleeve gastrectomy, you know, or going from, and some of the doctors, like some of those procedures will be a couple step procedure. Like I know our band, sometimes we take the band off, give it a little rest and then go back in and do the procedure. Sometimes they, if the doctors felt confident enough, they'd go ahead and just do it all as a one-time procedure. So medical problems will be one of the, the, the considerations for revision. Secondly, the patient has failed to achieve adequate weight loss from a prior weight loss surgery. So there might be specific stipulations um, in the patient's medical policy, insurance policy. Again, insurance dictates so much of this if you're wanting coverage. And so it may be based on a percentage of weight loss from a prior surgery and how close they were to their ideal body weight. So it's important to know what I would suggest is if you're considering a revisional weight loss surgery, call your insurance, see if you can get a copy of the medical policy, call your program, see if they can help you with navigating your insurance. And the third thing is, is um, some, some insurances only allow you to have so many bariatric procedures during the lifetime of your life, like a lifetime of their policy. So, so many bariatric procedures allowed per lifetime. Hope that makes sense. So not every insurance is like that, but some are. So it's important to know what your what your policy is. Now, if you're paying out of pocket, um, they might be able to be a little bit more lax on uh, on all of this. And um, the doctors and the nurses and your staff know how to navigate these things, and they can try to help you through it. Um, knowing kind of what questions to ask the insurance, knowing what problems, <laughs> problems that they're looking for. So kind of pause here for a second and we're done answering that one. And I want to also say here, so the next thing is what happens if we don't meet the criteria for weight loss surgery? So like, let's say you go in, you have an evaluation, and there's a couple things that come to mind here. So one of them is a weight consideration. Um, and it looks like, Gwen, Brittany, I'll let you read that if you want. Um, yeah, so GC said our program is not lax about how the surgery is paid for. We want the patient to be ready for from both a medical and mindset standpoint. So... Uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Care about your patients and you want to make sure they're successful. And I think sometimes it's hard. Like those things are sometimes hard for people to hear because they've yes. had it in their mind that that's what they want and they're excited about it. And sometimes you have to be really real and say, you know, is this the best thing for you? Like, is a revision the best thing for you if you're not ready to make lifestyle changes? You know, if you haven't lost the amount of weight, is it because the, the surgery wasn't successful or maybe because it was difficult for you to make those changes? And so that part needs to be addressed first, yeah. if that makes sense. And those are tough questions to ask, not mm -hmm. only a patient, but it's hard to ask for the patient to ask themselves that. I think that's it's really hard to, you know, try and be an un unbiased and answer those questions as honestly as possible, you know? Mm -hmm. It, it can be hard because, I mean, 
it's scary and it's it's it's, it it's like yeah. okay I, it's like you feel, sometimes people feel like a failure and maybe they just need additional support in an area you know that they mm-hmm. can't necessarily see so qualifications i'm going to say it may vary a little bit from facility silly um like one said some programs are a lot more stringent and really you know adhere to those things that are so important um weight requirements um if greater than a specific number may require weight loss before surgery some programs do require you know a little bit of weight loss some don't Mm -hmm. It just kind of depends. Um, this may be it also may be due to a maximum weight on beds and radiographic equipment, such as um, your CT scans and things like that. Like some facility in some of the surgical beds and things like that are um, have weight capacity issues. So it's important for your facility to know what their weight capacity issues are. So you make sure you don't get somebody, a patient that maybe. Um, for example, the the, um, the show that's on TV, which is my 600 pound life, you know, our facility made a decision, the facility I work for, that we would only do um, over, I think it was BMI 60, we wouldn't go over BMI 62 or 65, I think it was, mm-hmm. um, just because of um, equipment issues. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are facilities that are able to do that. It just kind of depends. You got to check. And then also age requirements. So, um under the age of 16 or over the age of 70. I know our facility did quite a few patients over the age of 70. We had one that was 84, one was 85 or something like that. You know, it depends on quality of life. Um, That to me has to be a major component in health issues accompanying, you know, where a person is because you do, it is major surgery, you know, even though um, it's, it's comparable to maybe like a gallbladder surgery, something like that. Some of these surgeries can be outpatient. Most of most of them, um, a lot of doctors do keep patients in the hospital um, at least overnight. Um, there's certain trends going on now with, um, say, for example, the sleeve gastrectomy. Some doctors um, will do those outpatient. Some like to keep them. And really, it just depends, too, on your medical history and how much close observation is required. But... Overall, I'm just going to say age can play a part in it. Um, There are facilities that will do surgery on, I'm going to call them pediatric patients, patients under the age of 18 years old. Um, I would say that is a specialty and that you probably want to check around. If you get on the ASMBS website um, and just check and see. You can usually find facilities that will do pediatrics. And it looks like there's, yeah, um, go ahead. uh, Okay. So sorry to, she says, sorry to keep chiming in. No, this is great. This is actually, Mm -hmm. I think we were pretty excited to have you on the call because this is what we were wanting. Um, So she says, sorry to keep chiming in, but you pick a tough topic to discuss with um, ridiculous about a amount of details based on the individual and she's she's so correct it's really we i know we keep saying it depends on your facility and your program and where you're at but it really does and it it, not only that Mm -hmm. but it's it's going to really depend on uh, any unique medical concerns or you know everyone's unique and for example you know i have not had surgery but brenda has and even if we were you know identical we got the same surgeries it's not it it could be very different too um because everybody's just different so um i think that's kind of what she's saying here hold on i just got to pop up uh here we go um the state you live in and your actual benefits of your insurance plan are also going to vary quite a bit too because not that's a great um point actually not everybody has Mm -hmm. insurance even you know so um it's going to depend on your plan and your benefits and everything um and then winter says i know this is off subject however my friend did the sleeve and lost 155 pounds she has a lot of extra skin will insurance pay for skin removal so that's an excellent question um brenda do you want to answer that or do you want me to sure sure i can help with that um so again it can be if you're wanting coverage for it. 
um, like insurance coverage for it. Depends on what kind of insurance you have, Medicare, Medicaid, um, private insurance. M many insurances will cover um, a panulectomy, which is a tummy tuck, in other words, um, if you have medical reasons that it's causing you issues. Some of those issues might be skin rashes, irritation to the skin. You have to have documentation, repeated documentation, okay? So that would be important. Now, as far as breast augmentation or breast reduction or arms or um, the floor de lee I don't know, I hope, hope I'm pronouncing that right. The different procedures that'll do like legs and uh, do uh, larger, like go all the way up to your breastbone, to your stomach and kind of go this way as opposed to just down at the bottom. Um, a lot of those do require payment out of pocket, okay? Because they're a little bit more cosmetic. Um, so you just have to, I would say the best thing to do is to schedule an appointment with a plastic surgeon, a consultation, and they can give you exactly. Now, most of the time you wanna be close to your goal weight before doing that because mm -hmm. you don't wanna be in the process of still losing weight um, normally. I mean, things. obviously every plastic surgeon is a little different. Maybe there's, um, <laughs> they, may have, they may say something differently. I know in the area that I worked at, that was their recommendation, but maybe different from state to state. And um, I and so you, while while we're on the topic of that, real quick, I'm sorry, Brenda. Um, no, go ahead. While we're on the topic of excess skin and the removal surgery, we actually did a live event, which is what we're doing today. It's another one of these events. It's available in our archive, and you can go and and look at the replay on Crowdcast. And we interviewed um, an affiliate of ours, Jessica. She's known as Sleeve Brittany Alone on Instagram, but um, we did an interview with her and she talked very openly and candidly about her experience with the um, skin removal surgery and plastic surgery. And we kind of, we touched on um, the cost of it too, if anybody's curious to, you know, learn what that is. Because as Brenda said, it it is covered sometimes, I would say more so, not not, not all the time. Um, so yeah, if you are, have any more questions about that, I just wanted to throw that in there and I left the link in the chat box too. And, and Brenda, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just going to tell you while you were talking, I'm putting it on Facebook here for us too. So oh, you are good. That's it. what yes. I was trying to do. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have it. Like I have my speaker off, so it makes it, it doesn't echo. So yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> makes it hard to do that sometimes. So I would say, um, and then GC says advocacy. I want to say something about that because I think that is so important. So each, um, so the ASMBS, there is, or the MBSA QIP program, which is the Metabolic and um, Bariatric Surgery and Quality Improvement Program. Um, they have state chapters. So each, each state has state chapters. And what that means is, is a chapter that will, um, help with working for advocacy and things like that for obesity and for working so that we can get these insurance companies to cover some of these people who are needing bariatric surgery. So thank mm -hmm. you. Access to care. Yes. Getting access to care. So advocacy is such an important thing for insurance companies to understand, you know, and a lot of times they follow suit with some of the bigger companies like Medicare, you know, Medicaid, things like that. So, um, if you are, how can I say this? If you're passionate about that out there, any of you, you know, that's a great thing to, to go to your state chapter and talk to them and see if there's anything you can do to try to help. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the other thing I'm going to kind of just say is some things that may disqualify you, at, disqualify you as a candidate or from insurance companies. Um, insurance coverage may include things like, and I'm just going to list a few. It doesn't mean ultimately, you guys, these are just potentials, okay? <laughs> They're not, it doesn't necessarily mean 100% that you wouldn't have surgery, but I'm just saying that there would be additional caution or um, concern, okay? So long-term steroid use. 
Um, I know we had patients that were on steroids that were allowed to have surgery, but they had to quit their steroids before surgery for a period of time. And the reason being is it um, can be really irritating to the stomach lining and problems like that. So um, it looks like GC also puts here um, the Obesity Action Coalition. Um, they, they have um, a place that she's listing a website and I'm going to copy and paste that over to Facebook too, unless I got my thing open. So I'll do that too here so that they have it. Oops. I clicked off guys. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So got it. Um, um, also, malignant cancer. So if you're being treated for a, a form of cancer that maybe could be life-threatening, you know, you want to get your your body and your life in order um, with that before you have weight loss surgery because that just complicates things. Mm -hmm. Heart or lung conditions that cause severe risk during anesthesia. Like typically a cardiac or pulmonary clearance will be required if existing conditions exist. So if you're considering having weight loss surgery and um, you want to make sure that you're okay, it's likely going to be required if you have a program that really does want to make sure that everything goes smoothly, likely they're going to want you to have cardiac or pulmonary clearance if you have a long-term long history of that. So something to think about. Chronic pancreatitis, because, you know, that is one of the major organs in the body, and you want to make mm -hmm. sure that you're doing okay there. Um, cirrhosis of the liver, depending on the um, severity. Okay, so maybe not kick you out if it's more of a mild, but definitely if you have a very severe case of cirrhosis, it may not be suggested. Um, blood disorders that affect bleeding time or clotting times. Um, if you have a bleeding disorder, maybe they just need to be aware of where you're at with that bleeding disorder. There may be, need to be additional treatments that kind of go alongside that, whether your bleeding time is slowed or it's too fast. You know, those can be risk that they need to kind of watch. You know, if you have a really um, strong history of blood clots, you may need a, a filter put in, um, Greenfield, fil Greenfield filter, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, it's a filter that goes in so that helps prevent blood clots to your lower extremities. Um, those can be put in and then taken out, you know, before surgery, put in before surgery, taken out after. There's um, medications they can give you after surgery to help decrease your risk of blood clots if you have a really strong history of, of um, having blood clots in the past. You know, you may want to be on um, shots post-surgery. So uh, pregnancy, you know, if you're pregnant, they're going to do pregnancy screenings. You want to make sure that, you know, why go into weight loss surgery if you're pregnant? Because mm -hmm. the ultimate goal of weight loss surgery is to lose weight. And you're wanting to make sure that you, with a baby, that you're really healthy. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be the best time to have um, strong weight loss, <laughs> a large amount. Um, a psychological, we talked about this earlier, psychological illness that may interfere with, um, post-operative lifestyle changes. So if they don't think that you're going to be able to make the lifestyle changes, you know, psych, um, mentally, um, maybe you have a learning disorder that makes you incapable of making the right choices and you don't have the right support to be able to help you with those choices. That might be as consideration, you know, or making sure that you have, maybe they just need to make sure you have a support system. There's just so many little things like Gwen said earlier, there's so many little things um, that kind of go along. So they don't ultimately mean you can't. It's just that there may need to be additional things in place. Um, alcohol or drug addiction mm -hmm. that's active. Like if you have an active, some type of active form that um, would prevent you from making decisions and recovery and all of that, you would want to get that in order before you had weight loss surgery. So those are the, that's kind of the list. Um, that I have. Does anybody else have anything that they'd like to add to that? Maybe that might be important to kind of consider or think about. Um, Let me check the other th book. Yeah. So. No, nope, nothing. Um, the other thing is, is what happens if you don't meet the criteria? So weight considerations. If your, B, if your body mass index is too low, okay, less than 35 without a comorbidity or whatever, 
you may be required to gain weight, to have surgery, or have a comorbidity. And so that kind of gets tricky. They can, the doctors can start searching for comorbidities, you know, sometimes sleep apnea, you can have a sleep mm -hmm. test to see if you have that, you may not be aware. Um, sometimes reflux issues, they maybe want to research those. Um, research high blood pressure, maybe having your blood pressure checked. Um, so you can kind of look at that. If your body mass index is just too low, then it may not, unfortunately, you may be able to, you may be able to find a physician that'll do surgery, but the insurance may not cover it. Yeah. Maybe paying out of pocket, but some doctors won't even go go that route. They want it to be a certain thing. So it just depends on the position. Um, also, you may be required to lose weight. We kind of talked about this earlier. So if your body mass index is, say, greater than 60, um, you may be required to have a little weight loss. Some programs require it regardless. Some programs say that that they want you to have a certain amount of weight loss before to be able to see that you're going to be able to make those changes. So um, again, every program is just a little different. Um, and Let's see here. So let's kind of talk about how to navigate your insurance requirements. So private pay, Medicare, Medicaid, maybe you have VA, like a veteran's insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and then also we're gonna kind of talk about codes for bariatric procedures. So the sleeve, the bypass, the duodenal switch, the lap band, um, balloon procedure. There are diagnosis codes. So when you're calling your insurance, Sometimes I will say not all the insurance people are that familiar with bariatric surgery. It helps to have somebody who is familiar with it. If you get a phone call and they act like they don't know what the heck you're talking about, um, it helps to give the codes because they can type in the code and they can magically look it up. Um, it can also help just hanging up and calling back and talking to another representative if you yeah. <laughs> like literally can't get the answer you want instead of getting frustrated. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing is, is having your bariatric surgery program help navigate it with you because they know the right questions. And it does take a little bit of skill. <laughs> I mean, you can ask those questions, but just like I said, not everybody is, is, is helpful with that. Um, I think we got a comment, Brittany, I'll let you. Yep. It's not just what your program requires, it's putting together what the insurance plan requires and what the program requires, which is why having an insurance specialist in the program is helpful. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and she probably knows this as well as I do. Mm -hmm. Whenever I first started working bariatric surgery, like there was, I did not have any training to do, to do that job, the insurance calls. And like literally you learn, you make 100 200, 500, 1,000 calls, mm -hmm. and you get pretty experienced with knowing the right kind of questions to ask them and who to talk to, because it is just as important to know that. Because you can, I've actually called a program and got to, like called, called, talked to one representative and then got a totally different answer the next time I called. You know, one said that it was covered, there was coverage, and one said there wasn't coverage. So, um, it is important to know the right questions to ask too. Definitely. Um, I, I used to sell insurance before I had this job. It was one of my jobs I had before. And I think that even, even from a representative standpoint, you had to know what questions to ask too, and what, what you, what information you needed so you could better assist the person on the call. And I think that's, um, even sometimes when I would call, um, we would call like an underwriting service to get an answer about a claim that was filed, if it would be covered or not by a customer. And even sometimes when I would call underwriting, I would get two different answers. So yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing. It's crazy. It is so crazy. Mm -hmm. And I know GC says the latest additions for every, for insurance, which changes every six months, so if you get one answer, you're going to want to call back, you know, and recheck that, especially if you're in the process, because that can change. And it's three to six months worth of attempted weight loss documentation. Usually that has to be um, documentation by a provider, typically. So nurse practitioner, physician, it wouldn't be just like going to Weight Watchers. Normally you would have to have like documentation in a physician's chart and, and and gc correct me if i'm wrong because it's going to change since whenever i was doing this 
um, as part of my role. PFTs, which is pulmonary function testing, important to make sure your lungs are, are good. Mm-hmm. Chest x-ray. So these are, to me, these are, the PFTs and chest x-ray would be things that normally our program would do on people who are at certain risk, but they may be requiring that. It sounds like they may be requiring some of that now. Oh, just in insurance. general. Yeah. So every board. insurance company is different for, for everyone, everyone. She said, yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, the other thing I want to say here is um, I would say number one, and I'm going to kind of um, we actually got a lot here, Brittany, like still a lot of information. There's, this is a huge topic. This is, like, yeah. And two, what happened was, is, um, I actually, within a week's period of time, I had two people come to me who were wanting to have weight loss surgery and had a ton of questions about how, how to navigate the system. And I thought, you know what, this is a great topic. So that's why we're, that's why I decided. Some people to, um, take literally years researching the, all of this stuff that we're talking about right mm-hmm. now before they are able to make a decision or before maybe they're, you know, given the go ahead by their insurance company, like, mm-hmm. yes, it'll be covered. So I think, you know, if you can do years and years and years worth of research and we're trying to condense it down to one hour, that's going to be challenging. <laughs> <laughs> so we may go over a little bit, but um, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. So I'm going to go back here to my ask a question, make sure I'm still in the same. Okay, I'm still in the same. So first, talk to your insurance company. Mm-hmm. Um, you may also contact the facility. I, I, I'm saying this over and over again because it is important. They can help you navigate it. They really um, can, yeah. They'll know the re- right questions to ask. When checking your private insurance, it's important to get a copy of the policy. I'm going to really emphasize that. Some insurance you can get online, you can put in your information and you can print that out of yourself. Some require you to call, talk to a representative. Some won't give it to you. Some say that I'll just give it to you over the phone. So um, I would say knowing which procedures are covered on the back of your card is a customer service number. So that's the number you're going to call. If you're a provider, you're going to want to use the provider services number. There's usually two different ones. Sometimes as a provider, we would call customer service to just try to if we weren't getting answers and just try a different route, but usually it's two different lines, not all the time, depending on the insurance. Um, but know your procedures that you're covered, um, know what the BMI requirements are, um, know if there's a supervised diet requirement, like DC was saying, um, which services are covered inpatient and outpatient, because there's differences there. You it know, is. some some would be, the sleeve, get, sleeve would be um, inpatient, some would be outpatient um and it looks like there is another comment it looks like correct Brittany. an average time for individuals to get through the requirements can be four to eight months and then things change frustrating and all involved we have the same goal to have surgery it's so true and it is it's upsetting because if you're a patient preparing to have surgery and then your insurance changes and they change what's required oh it's heartbreaking (laughs) Especially for, um, I know that this, this, I don't know if this has ever happened really in the past before, but COVID, you know, some people have gotten, they've gone through four to eight months or even longer a year, years, trying to get all of this, um, you know, straightened out with the insurance company for COVID to happen and their sur- surgery to be po- postponed. So oh. I, I actually was talking to an, a young lady about this last night, um, so I we understand if you're one of those people, we're sorry, we're here for you. But that really, um, she says persistence is key. Yeah, I would definitely agree. You just got to stay at it. 100%, 100%. Um, if it's, and you know what, this is how I look at, there's so many things in life. If, if it's the right thing for you, it will happen. If it'll it's the right out, thing yeah. for you, it will happen. It'll work out. And if it's not the right thing, it's okay. You know, there's there's other routes besides to losing weight and maintaining weight loss other than just weight loss surgery. But it, weight loss surgery is, a, is really effective. But um, I just, you know, sometimes, sometimes just letting that be the barometer too, you know. Um, the more resistance, the more resistance. Like sometimes, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. you're just fighting against a wall. Sometimes you got to just take a breath and kind of stand back for a moment. Um, okay, I'm still talking about what what sometimes insurance policies. Um, so another thing to ask is if your insurance requires you go to a specific facility. Okay, some facilities are covered by your insurance. 
you know, they're considered in network, some are considered out of network. So asking which hospitals are in network, out of network, if you have coverage at a non-network hospital, um, if you're required to go to an accredited center. And um, Gwen mentioned this earlier. So that means a lot of times it's a center of excellence. Um, it can be a blue distinction center. It can be an optum BRS center. Um, ask if there's any specific accreditations or any kind of like accredited center that you're required to go to because your insurance will not cover it if they're requiring you to go to it and you did not. Mm-hmm. Like I, I know before our hospital got accredited, we would have a patient, we had, we had this happen maybe once or twice. We, I guess we didn't ask the right questions. I mean, you live and you learn and somebody's getting ready to go to surgery and they find out they're required to go to accredited center and they have to change everything over, you know? And so it's, it can be really upsetting, you know, when you've went through the whole process and have to repeat some things. So make sure um, the big thing with accredited centers is, um, and, sh- and, and Gwen saying the accreditation refers to MBSAQIP ASMBS. So again, those abbreviations stand for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery and Quality Improvement Program. And then the ASMBS stands for American um, Surgery for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. And Center of Excellence is generally the words for insurance. So Center of Excellence or COE. Okay, and so another que- another super important question to know is what your deductible is. Mm-hmm. Because that's what you're going to, and you're going to want to know what your out of pocket is. Not only your deductible, but your out of pocket, because that's what you're going to end up having to pay out of pocket um, and knowing if you can afford it. Some insurances will be three to $5,000. That's mm-hmm. probably on the lower side. Some will be um, 10000 We've had insurances we've called before and they've been 15000 So you got to be prepared to pay that. And is that going to be, is your out of pocket um, justifiable or is it cheaper going? Uh, paying out of pocket, like as a self-pay patient. So those are important questions. Um, And then policy requirements for pre-op diet. And this was mentioned earlier, you know, are you required to do a three or six month? And I think a lot of insurances are going that route. I'd say, I know the general trend um, was, my, my point of time was like, Um, when I was doing a lot of these calls was probably about 70%. I mean, it sounds like it's much higher than that. What's Gwen saying now that that's a larger requirement. Um, And now I'm gonna just basically just touch on Medicare Medicaid before I talk about veterans insurance. So Medicare Medicaid, okay. Medicaid is kind of directed by your state. So if you have Missouri, I'm living, we live in Missouri and Illinois. Missouri and Illinois Medicaid, policies were different, their requirements were different. So I would say probably it's likely that every state's a little different. So you're gonna wanna know what those requirements are. Not every hospital does Medicaid, okay? Sometimes it's a little more difficult. I know we limited the number of Medicaid. We actually had a backlist for two to three years of Medicaid patients. We kept the list and those patients, we would follow up with them. We'd keep them on a list, it was a waiting list. It's sad, but... um, my knowledge is from Viewpoint of Florida. So so that might be, she was talking about the um, pre-op surgical diet, how long that is, or how, um, how much that's required now. So know what your state. Medicare, generally the requirements are probably a little bit more generalized across the nation. Um, but those change frequently. I know they changed probably three or four times while I was in my role as a bariatric coordinator. So um, talk to your bariatric coordinator. I don't even really want to get into all of that because um, they change so frequently. Mm -hmm. Um, Just know what they are and know, have your program help you with navigating that. Um, Not all states offer Medicaid coverage of bariatric surgery. It's important to remember too. Each state does offer um, differences in the policy. I know Missouri, there was two or three different forms of Medicaid that patients could have. And so it depended on the form of Medicaid. And then the general requirements were different for each one. So you had to like really do some investigation. We had a, we would get on the the Missouri Medicaid website and like look up their pot, their all, what what form of Medicaid they were on, and then that would help us with navigating the system. So it can kind of get complicated. Um, and I don't mean this to be difficult for anybody. I just want to let you know that um, 
some research is helpful. <laughs> and then veterans insurance, um, I'm not sure if that's generally state to state specific or if it's just generally um, everyone. I know Missouri, our veterans, we had they had coverage for bariatric surgery, but there was a rigorous program they had to go through. It was a year long. Um, they were oh, required wow. to go. Yeah, they were required to do a supervised diet for a year mm -hmm. um, with a program through their VA. Um, they had to have a caseworker that was working with them during that period of time. Um, I mean, if anybody else has anything they want to say about VA, but I, I just know it's important to talk to um, the people that help you navigate through that system, through the For VA. Sure. Yeah first and then talk to the bariatric surgery program and then your bariatric surgery program will coordinate with that person. Um, and then codes for bariatric surgery. And Brittany, I'm going to actually just copy these and put them in the chat. That yes. might be easier. And then for anyone who's rewatching, they can go to the chat and grab that too. Yes. Copy. And then I'll paste them and then are you able to do it into Facebook or do you need me to, to paste it over to Facebook? Because I can do that here real quick too. Um, I should be able to do it. If not, you know what? Here I got it. A big deal. Are you sure? Yep. Okay. I'll just paste it over there. Okay. Um, so got that. Um, the next thing, so that was, so that was basically, um, a lot of what I had to say about navigating insurance. Um, the next thing I want to say is what are considerations for self-pay? And I know we're kind of getting at the top of the hour. So if anybody does need to pop up, we totally understand. Just remember, all of these are going to be timestamped. The questions and answers are going to be timestamped under ask a question feature. So you can go back in and look at what what you missed out on kind of um, recontinue this conversation if you do need to pop off. Um, so self-pay and some considerations. And go back to my notes here. So before I say that, I also want to say um, pre-certifications and pre-authorizations. I want to just mention this because it is so important and Gwen might have something more to say about this since she's uh, works with this <laughs> with with a program but so what will happen is as you're preparing for weight loss surgery your program will collect all of this information from your primary care the pre-op lab work that you're required to have mm -hmm. the pre-op documentation for all your supervised diets all of those clearances that are required okay if there's additional testing required, like TSH, um, PFTs, chest X-ray, um, venous Doppler studies, all of that stuff will be collected. Um, documentation that shows that you're prepared for surgery, you know, um, that the surgeons talk to you, that he's went over risk and benefits and all that. There's a shit ton <laughs> of documentation, and it's almost like a check mark box. Sorry for the the language, mm -hmm. but it is a lot. And so a qualified person at the bariatric surgery facility um, puts all this stuff together and then gives it to your insurance company. And then yes. your insurance company makes a decision whether you're pre-authorized for surgery or not. So that's kind of your, your surgery program helping you with that. I would say probably most facilities do that. Um, I can't answer 100%, but I would say probably normally that would be the case. Um, so there's a lot to get together and turn in. So the process or process for preparing for surgery um, can be if you're self-pay and you're extremely healthy and there's not a lot of additional testing, it can go fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. But if you have an insurance and it requires, you know, six months of documentation or 12 months of documentation um, for pre-op diet, and requires you to, in because of medical conditions, you're required to have a lot of additional testing and clearances. It can take a while, yeah. like they were saying. Um, and then once that's all turned into your insurance, it can take anywhere from one day, we've, we would get them back fairly quickly, up to a month. Sometimes rare, but sometimes it would take longer than a month, sometimes up to two months, because if they were needing additional, you know, they would 
say, I need additional information. I need additional information. So you're constantly feeding. And sometimes they would say, this has not been approved. We need this and this and this. So then, you know, you're working to try to get additional approvals. So um, it can be quick or it can take a little while. So I know when you're planning your surgery, the pre-authorization process can be a little tricky. Um, again, your, your surgery program can help. And GC says, thanks for, thanks gosh for EMR. And that is so true. So that means a med a lot electronic medical records. Mm -hmm. It is so nice to have all that stuff. When, when, it, when it comes in, I don't know what her process is, but we would scan it into our system, into the patient's record, and we would just start collecting. So we collect all the pre-op teaching we did. We collect all the, the psychological visits. We collect all the pre-op diets. We collect, I mean, so it's all stored there. And then when it's time, you just submit it. And she says, but once approved, the roll, the rolls faster, the ball rolls faster than you think. <laughs> it's just getting approved through your insurance. That's going to be yeah. the, length, the lengthy part of it all. Um, but yeah, once you're approved, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Start the diet. They, pre -op diet. They, yeah. <laughs> um, so self-pay, I kind of, kind of uh, got off track there a little bit, but according to um, one of the websites I was looking at, obesity coverage, a bariatric surgery information site, the average cost of the sleeve gastrectomy is 14,500 while gastric bypass costs an average of 23,000. But many programs offer incentives that you may be able to find that some that are less, mm -hmm. um, some that are more. So that's just kind of an average. I mean, I've heard them going as low as 4,500. I've heard them going as much as 25,000 for a sleep gastrectomy. So it kind of depends on the program you're going to and all of that. And I know, Brittany, there's a comment. Did you want to get that? Yeah, uh, Winter said to get approved, it does take time, but it's well worth it. It's worth the wait. It's worth doing the things. It's worth being consistent and the persistence thing that was mentioned earlier. So pricing may be subject to BMI stipulations, medical history, for example, needing to be less than 50, no little or no reflux. It's just different with every every program. I know I just recently talked to a bariatric surgery program. They said that was theirs. That's why I wrote that down, but that's definitely not the case everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, different surgeries equals different pricing points. Oh, for sure. um, yes. And then going out of the country and considerations like um, Brittany and I, the one, the person that she mentioned earlier, um, Jessica, um, who is also sleep Brittany alone on Instagram. Um, she had went out of the country for her plastic surgery. I don't know that she did. I think she did not for her bariatric surgery, but maybe just for her plastics. Um, yeah, just for the plastics, I believe. But you're going to want to make sure that you trust wherever you're going. You know, you want a trusted facility with a low risk. So lots of research, I would say, is super important. Find out what's included pre and post care. That's in important when you're talking about self-pay. Is your first three months of visits included? Is your first year included? Is all your pre-op stuff included, including your psychology testing, your pre-op lab work, your additional clearances? Sometimes those clearances aren't included, like additional testing may not in be included. So it's important to know what's included and not included. Um, do you have a primary care or bariatric specialist in your area that can help you with follow-up once you have surgery? Because follow-up is mm -hmm. so important after it's bariatric surgery. It's very, very surgery. important. Yes. Especially that blood work, ladies and gents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, blood work is very important. Stay on top of it, please. <laughs> yes, yes. And Brittany, I know there's more comments. Do you want to read yeah. those? Yes. So, uh, Brenda, you actually kind of were talking about this already after, well, before she commented this. Um, and it says, so she's referring to, Brenda was talking about, like, an, um, an estimated amount of what you can expect each surgery to cost. And GC said that does not usually include hospital pre-op labs. They're not covered. Vitamins and supplements that need to be considered it's a very good possibility because I, that's something that we didn't really talk about in the beginning of this, but 
when you're making all of these decisions and you're trying to figure out if this is the route you want to go, another thing that you need to keep in mind is that you are making a lifetime commitment to be taking these, to take, well, not, not just these, but you know what I mean? Not just vitamins, here, but whatever, supplements, vitamins, yeah. you need to take them. Um, it's, it's a lifetime commitment. That's what I like to tell patients when you are signing and actually some programs actually make you sign an, an agreement, correct, Brenda? Mm -hmm. Some did, do. Did you, did you guys do that at yours? I don't remember. We had an agreement that was probably about 20 different things that they were agreeing to, and one of them was yeah. supplements, um, yes. that they were agreeing. Because it's so important because you're having a mouth, you're, you're not absorbing necessarily yes. the same way. Depending on the procedure you're having, you know, mm -hmm. that absorption is different for each, but can be important to play. And I think too, some other things to consider when financing, um, financing surgery is, you know, if your insurance isn't covering, if you have an issue, a complication, you may be expected to pay out of pocket for, um, for additional that. days in the hospital, uh, yes. additional surgeries, additional, anesth maybe anesthesia cost. Um, again, pre-op testing, some of those things, cardiac, pulmonology, GI testing, ultrasounds, sleep studies, um, sometimes, um, sometimes additional visits, you know, with your doctor. I'm sorry, my, my dog is sneezing. I <laughs> see, is that Hank sneezing? <laughs> I have him in my room here because I'm, I, I, he's, he's my come along friend right now because he's spending <laughs> the night with my son <laughs> since I'm traveling. Um, so the next thing I just want to mention too, oh, and she brings up a good point here, especially if going beyond the global period, what's covered. Yes. So sometimes those self-pay plans will only cover the first 90 days, which is called the global period, which is usually generally um, a follow-up period that's suggested for patients who've had any kind of sur surgical procedures. So the global period is important. It's 90 days usually. So does your insurance, does your self-pay coverage include po post the global period? It's important to know, like know your self-pay options. Um, so ways to finance. So we're going to talk about that here real quick ways to finance self-pay. Um, so care credit or United Medical Credit are some suggestions. Um, when you get online to your bariatric surgery program, they maybe have associations with credit places like those two I just mentioned mm -hmm. um, that may be um, willing to finance. Um, secured medical loans. So if you did that, interest rates may vary. A personal credit card could be a suggestion, but rates may be high. That would be only one thing that I would be really cautious about that. Um, hospital payment plans varies from facility to facility and not all programs offer that. So it's something to check out. Tax refunds, you know, saving your tax refund and using that towards um, part of your funding for your surgery. Um, sometimes people have even removed retirement funds or 401k like using a 401k loan like you're loaning against yourself mm -hmm. um those are options sometimes you do get um what is the word for it you get uh you have to pay a little bit of, like a penalty fee yes yeah. yes a penalty fee um by taking sometimes those things out, but it may be worth it to you if you're really wanting and you already have money to save back or maybe saving back cash. You know, um, we, one of the girls on here, I, I'm trying to remember who it was, but was talking about her plastic surgery and she'd been saving up for that, you know, cash. Oh, Scott, it's Scotty. Yeah. 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 Um, so it could be the same with bariatric surgery or revisional surgery. I'm um, getting an additional insurance policy or bar on bariatric surgery, primary or secondary to whatever you have, um, which highly suggestible, you know, something to look into. Um, or if you're insurance through an employer, talk to your HR department to see if this could be added as a rider to your current policy. Um, we had some people that were successful at doing that, you know talking to your boss and seeing what kind of insurance, talking to your, whoever your HR person is and HR, seeing if yeah. they can add something onto your insurance. Um, depends on how big your corporation is, if it's bigger or smaller. And then funds from a health savings account, HSA. Those are all some ideas I have. See if anybody else has any ways that they financed surgery. 
Um, Are we going to talk about um, the WLSFA? Were you planning on talking about them at all? Or... Um, regarding this, regarding payment? Well, I... Financing? Yeah. Not, I mean, not financing. <gasps> you know, I hadn't thought about it. Brittany mentioned yeah. it. Talk about it. So, um, there is a great, uh, I'll share my screen, too, for this, actually, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, let me get to the website first. Um, there's a great organization that we actually had the pleasure of meeting, um, and we're doing a live with them here. We are, up, Brittany. Yes, we are. Um, that it. That's not until February, though, right? Let me look at the date while you're looking that up. Okay. We're doing. We're talking to um, Laura Van Tool mm -hmm. on February second, which is um, a couple weeks from now. February second, the WLSFA is Weight Loss uh, Surgery Foundations of America. And um, I'll let Brittany share. I don't want to ruin so her surprise here. There are a great, um, they're a great organization because they raise money for funds for patients who cannot afford the surgery. They pay for them to get the surgery done. Can you guys see this website at all? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is just the homepage. I'll go ahead and copy and paste their link in here too that so um, as we were saying we are doing a live event with the founder of this organization in February Brent is pulling that stuff up now but the WLSFA is a great organization um, in fact they also have a patient event coming up in March I believe it's March 11th through the 13th and it's going to be in Las Vegas in the United States so there will be a lot of uh, other patients there, but it's a great organization because as I said, it it's centered around not only um, awareness, but um, advocating and educating people on obesity as a disease and also um, bariatric surgery. So it's, it's an amazing uh, organization. They always have grants and um, other events going on too. We just participated not too long ago in the Stomp Out Obesity event that they had. Um, so yeah, if you want to learn more about WLSFA or maybe if you could be a candidate for someone who could get a um, get the surgery paid by them, I would highly encourage you to check out their website and contact them, reach out to them, see how you can, um, you know, become a part of that. Yeah, so, so basically they give grants out every year and they fund so many surgeries and so you can look at their site and it will tell you who they funded and follow up on their process progress and that type of thing so um Brittany posted the link i posted it on facebook so that oh you, you did i was that. just yeah gonna do that. okay perfect thank you yeah and um, they actually have a patient centered conference every year which Brittany mm -hmm. talked about the 11th through the 13th um i'm gonna be attending um and um looking forward to that so Hopefully, hopefully we'll see some more of you guys possibly even be there or be on our call on February 2nd. Um, and so I really only have one more thing to kind of talk about before we kind of close up here. And that is here. Let me look at my ask a question feature. What things should I consider financially when scheduling? What things should be considered when, when scheduling weight loss surgery? Mm -hmm. One of them you just mentioned, you know, you're going to be required lifelong kind of checkups you know, um, making sure that you're doing well, that your body's absorbing the nutrients they need. Um, so one thing important, bariatric vitamins, you know, <laughs> we're, our sponsor, ProCare is ProCare Health. So obviously we're, we know the importance of that and we're stressing that. So knowing that that will be an extra expense. So, I mean, like thinking about these things ahead of time. My thinking is though, is what I used to tell patients is it's not, really you're rearranging your budget like what you maybe spent money on before maybe mm -hmm. you're spending it differently now yes. maybe like junk food maybe you're spending it on healthier foods um yeah. instead of having to be on so many medications maybe you were on 10 medications before and you cut that in half to five or two or one or none and now you can spend that on vitamins so yes you know there's a give and take you're healthier um, i think that's a really good way to look at it and i'm happy that you 
you said that because if you really, really want this and the only thing from stopping you is, oh, I have to take vitamins the rest of my life, then I don't know what to tell you. Because, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, and I, I understand it is expensive, but there's there's affordable alternatives out there. You know, I mean, ProCare Health, we pride ourselves in being one of the most affordable bariatric supplement companies. Um, so definitely do your research on, on supplements and see what you think is going to work for you and your budget. Yeah. 100%. Um, knowing if... Um, knowing it says not covered by insurance. So knowing your cost, cost comparison of what to expect to pay out of pocket. Um, it's strongly recommended, you know, that, um, you're checking that out. Certain, dis certain procedures may have bigger requirements. Like say, for example, example, the duodenal switch, there may be additional add on mm -hmm. requirements to so knowing your insurance coverage, protein supplementation, it's typically not covered by insurance, so you may have to turn in receipts. You can sometimes people use their health savings account, HSA, HAS, mm -hmm. or, I'm sorry, HSA, um, a doctor's prescription may be necessary. I think this is a great time to, too. I just want to do a little add in because we're so excited about this. We just got our new protein product in, guys. It is hot off the shelf. And I don't want to make this a commercial, but I do want to mention it. I got mine right here. So we Mine's have a vanilla. And how these stand apart, whoops, how these stand apart, you guys, is um, they have 26 grams of protein. They're very low in carbs, one gram of carb. Um, they have an immunity support blend. I mean, that is so important right now. Yeah. They have definitely. electrolytes. So like if you're pre-surgery or post-surgery, those electrolytes may be super helpful or if you're working out. That's how it's different. It's gluten-free also as well. So just a little plug. Um, also, one other, I have just a few more. If you do have insurance, how you will pay deductible and out of pocket cost. Okay, so it's important to think about all those extra costs. Um, and getting follow up appointments. So, will you have a ride? Sometimes there are taxi services for free, Medicaid sometimes covers in areas. We had several patients from, um, we had several patients that came in from nursing homes and talking to their support systems you know the nurses and the doctors that were in there and helping them was important but also making sure that they were able to get rides to the hospital i mean that's important your follow-up is important um will you be able to get the types of foods recommended after surgery maybe you live in the shelters or the nursing homes the care facilities um and it's just good to include all those caretakers in with that process um and recommended follow-up visits. So if you're paying out of pocket, are these covered? If not, who are you gonna have your follow-ups with? Some of our patients, if they didn't have specialty coverage with bariatric surgery after their surgery, maybe they paid out of pocket for their surgery, self-pay. Some of them went to their primary care and then we worked with their primary care doctor to make sure that they were testing all the right blood tests after surgery and making sure they were keeping an eye on the right things. So it was kind of like we were working through their primary care with them, but um, they didn't have to come and see us in the office. But mm -hmm. uh, follow-up care is important. And are you changing insurance soon? And will the new insurance cover follow-ups or bariatric complications? So if you're right in the midst of changing insurances and you're right in the midst of having weight loss surgery, make sure and check that out. Yes, for sure. So, um, so Brittany, um, Brittany has, looks like she's on here kind of talking about our whey protein stuff. So I'm looking, I don't see any questions other than that. And so, I mean, I appreciate you guys. This was um, also a couple other things I just thought of. End of year deductibles. If you're, you know, we're at the very beginning of a new year, mm -hmm. it is perfect timing to start a process now yes. so that you have plenty of time. I know there's lots of restrictions now with COVID. Some hospitals are doing these types of surgeries, some aren't. So checking that out. Um, also, you may need to be off for a specific amount of time after surgery for recovery. So some surgeons require a couple days to a month. So do you have days off to cover that? PTO pay time off. Do you need to save up for that? Or is your work going to allow you to be off for that? Um, that was a huge consideration for some of our period. 
patients. The global period, I've already talked about that, so I'm not going to mention it again, but that's important. Um, and there are some grants and free giveaways. We just talked about that too. So they are far and few between. Research would be required. So WLSFA was one of those that we mentioned. And GC said, um, do you need to, just expanding off what Brenda was just talking about, PTO, if, do you have enough time to cover you being off and, um, you know, staying at home? Do you need to do FML paperwork early? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look into that. See if that's something that you need to do to maybe help you um, go home and recoup. So what she's talking about there is um, FMLA is um, Family Medical Leave Act. Mm -hmm. And so that... So that is like right after you have surgery. So that's for you or one of your family members if one of yep. your family members is staying home to be with you. And that's kind of like the same with pregnancy or things like that. So what you would be required to do typically is go to your human resources department and they could give you a copy of the paperwork. Typically, um, it, it could be, it's usually, we always filled out our patients for us, except for their first page. Their first page was kind of like um, a little bit more about them and about their um, procedure. You know, it's not necessary your program has to know, I'm sorry, it's not necessary that, that the place that you're employed has to know why you're being off, but the HR department may have to have some of that information for coverage of FMLA. So you may just have to work privacy reasons, um, ha have to let them know how you feel about your privacy and that type of thing. So start that early. You don't have to use it, but nice to have as a backup. It is nice because it kind of protects you so that you can have that time off um, in, case you, in case you need it. So it's a protection. Um, and I think that's everything. Boy, we went over today. I mean, it's 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 good though because it's a lot of information, and hopefully this will help somebody with navigating the system as they prepare for everything. So, as always, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to put the um, ProCare marketing email down here. Um, that's a great resource for you to email any questions that you might have especially if you're watching this as a replay and we're not on the call to take any questions. Um, so if you watch this and you have any questions after the fact, please um, email us at this uh, email that I'm putting in the chat box and the comments on Facebook right now too. Do you want me to copy it over to Facebook, Brittany, for you? Uh, just sent it. Oh, did you? Okay, great. Be, I should be on there. So okay. yeah, if you have any questions, just let us know. That's what we're here for, and hopefully we can help you navigate um, any, you know, any anything that you might need. So, yeah, GC, thank you so helpful. much for all the yeah. information today. You were you were very helpful. Yeah, great yeah. job for Especially a tough topic. Being thank active. you. Yes, being thank active you so in that much. role, um, helping us. So, um, you guys feel free to share this mm -hmm. with people that you think could benefit from it that are that are considering you know, having weight loss surgery and have a lot of questions, um, really and truly having somebody to talk to and having somebody to reach out and answer questions can be so helpful. So, um, moi, love you guys. Thank you. Bye All everybody. You have a great week. We'll see and, you next week. Yes, it, it's I, Wednesday next week. <laughs> You know what? Let me look here real quick. Oh, wait, no, it's um, Monday, isn't it? It's Monday. And actually, I'm kind of mm -hmm. excited about this. We are going to be talking to um, Jason Smith from Bariatric. Brittany, <laughs> it looks like a kick drop. Um, we're going to be talking to Jason Smith from Barry Nation, B A R I dash Nation. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. So <laughs> she said, I don't know what happened. Barry Nation. And it will be Monday. And it will be at. Uh, 5 30 p.m. <laughs> Central Standard Time. Brittany, I'm not tired of you. <laughs> she said, I, I guess Brenda's sick of me. It just kicked her off for some reason. I have no reason understanding why, but see us next week on Monday, 5 30 p.m. Central Standard. And we look forward to seeing you then. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.